comes about by accepting him as Lord and Savior, that he would always be with them. And in that promise, sometimes I think the community and we as people have misunderstood what that means. I think our understanding comes about that this is a rose garden, that nothing bad will ever happen to us, that we pray and instantly everything will be changed, and we all know that's not the case. We all know that there are times in our lives when it feels as if prayer and everything else we are doing simply doesn't seem to change the situation. So James begins his letter by addressing in his community something bad has happened to you even though you love Jesus Christ. You're feeling as if God has abandoned you. You're feeling as if this brokenness isn't being cared for. How do we deal with that? And James begins his letter with this conversation. I would like to begin the conversation with something that almost is completely away from the letter. It comes from second and first grade camp that I led for a number of years at Wesley Forest. And at Wesley Forest, there's a thing called a monkey bridge. And the monkey bridge basically is a long cable stretched between two trees about five foot off a creek. And out here are two ropes to hold on to. And the idea is, is to tightrope walk across the cable and put your hands out here and hold on to the rope. Well, every first or second grader that came to camp absolutely wanted to walk on the monkey bridge. And if their parents knew we were going to let them walk on the monkey bridge, I think they wouldn't have left them with us. But we had counselors that we talked to, and they would teach the children how to put their feet on this cable by walking on dry land. They would teach them how to hold their hands to walk on this monkey bridge. And then toward the end of camp came the test. And the test was they actually got on the monkey bridge and walked. We did not lose any child into the water. No child ever fell off the monkey bridge in the 15 years that I did first and second grade camp. And almost every child grabbed their parent and hold them by the arm out to the monkey bridge to show them what they could do. They got on the monkey bridge to see if it were possible to get to the other side. And they were testing their ability. And when they got to the other side, they passed the test. Now, the temptation that would come into this monkey bridge situation were if the counselors were on the other side going, don't pass the test, don't pass the test, fall in the water. Or if they would grab the cable and shake it so they would fall in the water. Now, I'm sure there might be some adults and teenagers that would love to see kids fall in the water, especially after they kept them up the night before. The temptation would be, See, the temptation part is for the counselor or the adult or another child in the group to satisfy their own desire to see somebody publicly humiliated. Now, folks, God never puts us on a monkey bridge with a cable suspended and two arm rails and stands there and shakes the cable. I think that's where we've been misinformed. Because sometimes we think God's shaking the cable to test us to see if we can hold on. The cable may shake, but according to James, God's not the one shaking the cable. Life does. The tempter does. People do. God's yearning is for us to get to the other side of the cable. God's yearning for us always is to pass the test. We can name a lot of names. Joni Erickson Todd, you know that story with the quadriplegic who was left with a life in shambles. 
I can't see God doing that to her. But after the fact that was happened, her faith was tested, would she be able to still worship and celebrate God's presence in the midst of such a horrible situation? <clears throat> and if you've read her books, you know she did. She passed the test. And her faith is stronger today than it was before. And for many of us, you could stand up in this congregation and share with one another places where your faith has been tested, where you wondered if you could make it to the other side, where you wondered if you could go one more day. But there were those undergirding arms, strengthening, giving courage. And because we made it once, when life comes at us again and our faith is being tested, we have this history. I did it then. I can do it now. Because this testing, this, this struggles mature us. We, we don't see God as that Santa Claus God anymore. You know what I mean by a Santa Claus God? You go to church on Sunday to pay the insurance policy so that something good will happen to you before the next Sunday. My mother was good about that. You know, if we miss Sunday worship, she said, guess what, something bad's going to happen to you before next week. And she'd wait, and she'd wait, and she'd wait, and then she'd say, see, if you'd have been in church, that wouldn't have happened to you. Do you know how long it took me to get over that? <laughs> There's still times when I have to go to church on Sunday regardless. And on vacation, I find a church. But the point being is that God is not Santa Claus. God is about maturing us and about building faith in us so that we know whether we're alive or whether we're dead, whether we're struggling or whether we're dancing. God is still with us every step of the way. He will never abandon us, and he will never leave us. It has been so interesting as I watch over the development thing. I actually have read this, and then it was drawn back to Job. You know Job. That's a story we don't like very much. But Job is really about why bad things happen to good people. Job celebrated he worship. He even would bring his children home and, and do sacrifices for them to make sure they were still in God's loving care. <clears throat> and then the world fell apart. He lost everything. Not because God took it away, but because God allowed things to happen around Job. And Job showed us that it's possible to keep your faith even when all else fails. As friends, folks, of people who are going through trouble, I hope we don't look like Job's friends. Because Job's friends weren't too kind to him. Check the story out again and again. They tried to blame Job for everything. If you had a little more faith, Job, if you get down on your knees, Job, if you curse God, Job, all this would go away. But Job would not do that. In that time of trial, he held to what he knew. In fact, if you read the first chapter of Job, you will find that after he's lost everything, the first thing he does is get down on his knees and worship God. When somebody says to you, I wish you would have the patience of Job, you may not want to be so willing to accept that as a compliment. Because Job gave everything he had, even in disaster, to get down and worship God. But I want to, I want to read an interesting part of that first chapter because Job is sitting there and people are coming and telling him what has happened. And the servant... That servant was still speaking when a second one came running up saying, God sent down a fire to kill your sheep and your servants. Guess what? According to James, God did not send down the fire. 
we are always quick to say God did this or God put us in this place because we struggle with a God that is so much in control that how can this happen if God didn't will it to happen? If you look at Job, what God does is stands back. God doesn't do the bad things. God stands back to allow the testing to occur so that Job can prove and show what is really happening in you. You know what's that old saying? If somebody really loves you and you let them go, they'll come back. See, God has to let us go sometimes. Because if we really have faith, then we'll look to him in our time of trouble. We'll stick with him. We won't blame him for all that's going on around us, but we will know he will be able to carry us through and see us through to the next stage of what's happening with us. Those are hard things to wrap our minds around. Hard things for us to intend. Now I have to say to you, we never told our first and second grade parents that their children were going to cross the Moti Bridge. If you're a parent, you will know why. Because if we had done it with the parents there, or if we had told the parents this was going to happen, <coughs> and they went out to see the monkey bridge, at least half of them would have told us their children were not allowed to cross the monkey bridge. And they would tell us that because they figured their child would fall in and get hurt. And they wanted to protect them. And we said, the parent <coughs> needs to stand back. The parent needs to trust that their child has the ability to get across the bridge. <coughs> I've had more than one parent come to me and say, I would have never let my child do that. I was amazed. But then we had the best counselors in the world. There are times when we'll have to walk our monkey bridges. There are times when we will have to do the things we don't want to do. <coughs> and go through some trials and tribulations we wish we would never be put to the test. But they're part of the way we mature in faith. They're part of the way that we grow to understand God's grace and love and care that surrounds us in preparation as we continue the journey through eternal life. May God give us understanding and wisdom and blessing on this journey. Amen. <coughs>